Hey guys, Sheldon here with VSL, and today we're talking about hashing versus encryption. Uh, some people think they're the same thing, so I used versus to let you know they are two distinct different things. So let's go ahead and start with hashing. So hashing is a one-way process. Think of pulling a fingerprint from a crime scene, okay? When you pull the fingerprint, if that fingerprint is in the database, then they can tell the person who was at that crime. You can't take the fingerprint and determine, oh, the bad guy was six foot tall, 230 pounds, et cetera, et cetera. That's one way. Same with hashing. Data goes in and a hash comes out. You're not converting the data. What you're doing is generating a unique fingerprint off the data. And it is one way. So you can't take the hash and get to the original data. So let's, let's take an example of you signing up for a website. What you do is you fill in your username and then when you fill in your password, the password is ran through an algorithm and a hash is generated. It is that hash that non-reversible hash that is saved in the database, not your actual password. The next time you visit that website and you supply a password, it's ran through the same algorithm and the two different hashes are compared. And if they're the same, then you're into the website. So that's why if you forget your password, a good website won't be able to tell you what your original password was because they don't save it. They save the hash or the fingerprint of that password. That's why you're usually sent a link that makes you go ahead and uh, change your password. Here we have four different algorithms and another component of hashing algorithms is they all produce the same bit hash. So in other words, the MD5 will always produce 128 bit hash. The SHA-1, I believe that's how you say it, SHA, produces 160 bit hash. So um, no matter what data you're grabbing a hash of, you're trying to produce a hash of, if you use the MD5, your hash will always be 128 bits. And parenthetically, you can see what the hexadecimal uh, equivalent is. Each hexadecimal character is four bits. So 32 hex characters times four bits equals our 128 bit hash. 40 hex characters times four is our 160 bit hash. So anyway, the point here was all these algorithms, depending on the one you use, will generate the same hex or the same bit size hash. And I can tell you that the MD5 and the SHA-1, they're not really used a whole lot anymore because they are more prone to what we call collisions. Uh, the SHA-256 and the SHA-512 are much more popular. And we'll talk about collisions in a minute. So again, let's say we want to generate a hash of the password, password123. And likewise, we want to generate a hash of all the seven Harry Potter books in digital form. You ran those through an algorithm, such as the SHA-256, you would get a 64 hex long character hash. Now, this hash is made up just for the sake of this video. If the password 123 generated this hash, and so did all seven of the Harry Potter books, we would say that's a collision. So a collision is when two different sources of data yield the same hash. So let's look at this hash a little bit more. So this hash is 64 characters, which is 256 bits. Again, because each character is four bits. So each hex character in this hash is four bits long. 
So now we get into what we call binary notation. A bit can be either a zero or a one. And so if four of these represent our hexadecimal character, there's only 16 possible combinations. So we, we utilize the numbers zero through nine and the letters A through F to represent these hexadecimal characters. So you should never see when you're looking at something in hex, anything over the letter F. Another neat thing about the properties of these hashing algorithms is called the avalanche effect. Note these two passwords. The only difference is one starts with a capital P, the other has a lowercase p. And look how different these, hash, these hashes are. Just, there's absolutely no tie between the two of them. So getting back to the collision real quick, this is how many different SHA-256 possible hashes there are. It's a lot of numbers, 78 different digits, I think. 78 digits, rather. So there is a chance that two pieces of data can yield the same hash, just highly, highly unlikely. And so with like the MD5 and the SHA-1, the number of possibilities was much less, therefore more prone to collisions. Now, all of this is said without salting, without, take, without taking salting in mind. So now, what is salting? So imagine you create a list of common passwords, hundreds and hundreds of common everyday passwords, along with their 256 hash. This is what we call a rainbow table attack. So if a bad guy gets into a database or somehow, some other way, gets your password hash, they can look it up in this table, and if it exists, they know what your password is, and they can get into your website or do whatever they want with that password. So with salting, what we do is we generate a unique string. And this is typically done for every account, so it's not like a website uses a you know, random string. It's every single account for that website would use a different string. And so when you take this very common password of one, two, three, four, five, you tack on that salt, that random string afterwards. Now you have a very uncommon password and a very uncommon hash. So the hash can't be looked up. And all of this happens behind the scenes. Okay, so like if you're creating an Amazon account, Amazon will salt the password nothing you have to worry about or think about. So another use for this, um, for hashing, let's say I have something on my website that I want to download. And what I would do is I would publicize my hash so that you could download this thing, whether it's a document or a program, you could then generate the hash on that document or program. And if you get the same hash, then you know it's okay to go ahead and use whatever it is you downloaded because it has not been altered. The assumption is, of course, is if you trust me and the hashes match, you can trust the document or the thing you downloaded. So the hashes match, everything is good. So let's look at how we can generate this hash by ourselves. Uh, on a Windows machine. What you see here is the command to generate a hash. It's a cert util hyphen hash file, then the name of the thing you want to generate the hash of, and then the hash algorithm you want to use, such as SHA-256. Let's go ahead and watch this little video. I'm in the downloads directory with a command prompt, and I created a file called sensitive document. It's just a word file. I'm going to go ahead and run this command on the document and note that the, the document name is not case sensitive, so you don't have to worry about that. And we can see here now that we've generated the hash, the SHA-256 hash, 
of this document. So hashing can be used to help with password storage, data integrity, and digital signatures. So let's get into encryption, which is a little bit easier of a topic. Now encryption is two-way. The purpose of that is to take some data, you go ahead and encrypt it, it gets to the other, to the recipient as what we call cipher or ciphertext, then they can decrypt it to get back to the original data. Here we see four different algorithms and I'm just going to say that, you know, some of these are fallen out of favor, as I said about some of the hashing, because they're so old. But we have what we call symmetric and asymmetric encryption algorithms. Symmetric uses the same key to both encrypt and decrypt the data. Asymmetric uses a public key to encrypt data and a private key to decrypt data. So with encryption, think plain text gets converted to ciphertext. We utilize keys, either a public-private set, public's always for encryption, private for decryption, or we use one key in symmetric algorithms. The same key is used to encrypt and both decrypt. The encryption, the ciphertext, will result in various sizes because we are going back to the original data. So if you encrypt password 123, you're going to get a small ciphertext. You encrypt all seven books of Harry Potter, you're going to get a very large ciphertext. So an illustration here, you take the plain text coupled with either a symmetric or public key that generates the ciphertext. Take the ciphertext and again either couple it with a symmetric key, the same symmetric key, or a private key to get your plain text. So, some purposes of encryption data protection. We have a BitLocker video that shows how you can encrypt your entire hard drive so that if bad guys steal your computer and yank out the hard drive to try and read it, they get nothing but garbage. And it's also used for secure communications and file security. Uh, a good secure communication example is when you do anything with your banking website, or rarely for almost any website anymore. The data, as it's leaving your computer, is encrypted. Then when it gets to the other side, it is decrypted and used for whatever it needs to be used for. So I hope you found this uh, video uh, educational. And if you have any questions, leave them in the uh, comments below. Thank you.